Well, those guys preached up a storm last night. Did you see that? <laughs> that was incredible. But to the extent that the earth was repressed by the rain, so our spirits have been this week. And we're so thankful that you've come on this last morning as each guy is just going to empty the tank today and we get to be the beneficiaries. There was a ruling, Russ, that you need to be aware of. You are allowed to keep the championship, but there will be an asterisk by your name in the book. <laughs> Just wanted you to be aware of that. Brother Stevens is going to lead us in a song before our first lecture, and uh, I'm going to ask our shepherds to lead us in prayer today, and so Dub Simpson, if you'll lead us in prayer after the song, and then we'll look forward to what Jordan has prepared about what the scriptures say about the grace of God. Thank you for being here. Almighty and merciful Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace at this hour, thankful for all that you've done for us. We can barely express our appreciation and understanding of the tremendous mercy you have shown to us in the sending of your Son and the plan that has been revealed down through the ages and through your word by the Holy Spirit but we are so extremely grateful for this tremendous blessing. We pray that we might study your word and understand it better, put it into practice in our lives, try to share this with others in the community and family and friends so that they too may be able to partake of this wonderful blessing. We're so thankful for this week, for the speakers that have come our way, for the preparation that they've done, for the excellent presentation that they've made to us. We pray that we would continue to listen attentively to the words they have to say from your scriptures, that we might strive to be a shining light in this community and to bring others to the cause of Christ. And we're so thankful for the wonderful sacrifice that he made on our behalf. And we ask all this through his name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. In Titus chapter 2, we're going to find our, our place of study and focus for our first lesson this morning. Titus chapter 2, I ask you to open your Bibles Get on your phones, your tablets, however you're going to be having the Word of God in front of you today. It needs to be in Titus 2, and we'll be there in just a moment. 
In some ways, it, feel like, it feels like just yesterday, we all rolled here into Houston and unpacked ourselves and was preparing for a week, and now we have arrived at the conclusion of a wonderful week together. It has been a tremendous blessing, and there's so many to thank, and I, the first and foremost is, is your shepherds for the incredible opportunity. 43 years of these lectures, of providing for not only your own sheep, but for all who will listen for years to come. Thank you so much for having the foresight and the blessing to see that we need some time in the Word of God, and thank you so much for the invitation of allowing me to play a part in this. It has been a blessing to get to know your sheep and to be encouraged by them and to get to, to see their zeal for the Lord. And I thank you so much for this amazing honor. It's been a blessing to be with the fellow speakers. I am conceding in the race. I have given up despite every attempt I have made to win my daughter's affection. We even made a joke coming in that I'm preaching first and so we can leave when Russ begins to preach. <laughs> and there was an adamant veto of that in a parking lot, that we must stay. <laughs> so you win the week, but they go home with me. <laughs> I will say this because it's true, and there's no, there's no pomp in this. I mean every word. But to you, Brother Russ, and Brother Ken, and Brother David, and it's true as well, Brother Tim Stevens, and Brother Tim Jennings, and Brother Bubba, and of my dad, and of many others I know who are here who, who labor in the gospel, my generation owes much to you. And my generation of preachers would not be where we are were not for you men, for your work, for your labor, for your teaching. You endured a lot that we didn't have to endure, and we're blessed because of it. And I speak on behalf of men who humbly understand that we stand on, on roads that you have paved. And we stand today confident because of the faith that you have passed along to the next generation. So thank you. Thank you for your example. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you for your love. Thank you for showing us what it means to be laborers in the gospel and to preach with power and with conviction. And thank you this week for feeding me and for my family. It's rare for me to be able to bring my family on the road with me, and they usually don't come. And we have made it to Thursday limping and coughing and wheezing all along the way. <laughs> That's part of the reason why. But thank you, good brethren, for showering my wife and my children with love and affection this week. My wife is the reason that my children love the Lord. My wife is the reason that they have learned about Jesus and love Jesus. They are who they are because of their wonderful godly mother, and I'm thankful for that. And my brother Tim, I know we've talked about the preaching championship and, and what's taking place. I will tell you this, we spent time with you in the spring, and about every afternoon, I'll peek into my Noah's room. He will ask me to set up a pulpit in his room, and he's not preaching, he's leading singing because he has seen what you have done, and so I thank you for it. Brother Bubba, it's been a blessing to be with you, and I wish our paths would cross more often. You've blessed me more than what I can say, and I'm thankful. Thankful for all of you, and thankful for a wonderful week. It's been wonderful to have my mother, because I can completely tank it here, and every one of you might hate everything that I'm about to say, but she's the one who will always say, that was the best thing I've ever heard, and that's what you need when you have a mother. And it has been everything to have my father here. There was a time when, when he sat back and he was taking notes, I would get real nervous, thinking, what am I doing with my hands or, or my feet? But I am who I am because of Roger Schaus, and he is my hero and my favorite preacher. And having him here and spending this time with him has meant so much. So thank you for giving me the gift of a week with my family and a week with you. And thank you for calling our minds back for leaving us with something to think about much longer than just these past four days. And every question and every trial and every decision we make as individuals or collectively as God's people, what says the Scripture? Let's go back and be a people of the Word. We're going to end today in this first, this first of, of my lessons, <clears throat> the first of this morning, by asking what says the Scripture about the grace of God? Acts 20, verse 24, describes the Word of God as the gospel of His grace. The grace of God puts the good in the good news. 
It reminds us why it is that Jesus came to earth and why it is that this word is so appealing. Oftentimes we hear grace described as, as maybe the old language of unmerited favor, and we really don't understand exactly what those two words mean together. And the Old Testament, the word for grace is chanan, which means to stoop down. It, it paints a picture of a king who's passing through town, and he sees a commoner on the side of the street, and out of his own compassion... And love, nothing earned by the man who is there. He simply reaches down and bestows a blessing and a gift, purely out of kindness and love. That's the language, like out of Psalm 84 and verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace. He gives kindness. He gives mercy. He gives compassion and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. In fact, when we find that word grace, especially in the New Testament, there's always certain words that are associated with it. Words like goodness or kindness, or mercy. And so in the New Testament, our word is charis, a gift. We use that word charity to talk about an undeserved gift or an unprompted gift of kindness. And so we think of Acts 17, that the goodness of God is seen in everyday life. The God, Paul says, in Athens, who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. You know what I like about this verse in the lens of grace is that oftentimes when we talk about grace, we talk about it in terms of salvation, saving grace, the grace that forgives our sins and, and seals with confidence our salvation in Christ. But have you thought about God's grace, his goodness, his kindness, and his mercy demonstrated just in everyday living? That the fact that you and I woke up today to a new day and a new morning with a beautiful sunrise, that right now, without you having to even think about it, our, our lungs are breathing and our heart is beating and every bit of all the good things that we have is but a small demonstration of the depth of God's kindness and love and mercy. His grace is abundant in everything we see. It's a part of our daily life. And so maybe molding these together, we might say, perhaps a little deeper and more clearer than unmerited favor, grace is simply a deliberate decision to give something good to someone who doesn't deserve it, and that is our God. He has deliberately decided to bless his creation with every good thing that we have. Paul would use that language in 1 Timothy 6, every good thing that we have, every gift. And James would use that, every good thing comes from the Father above. And we don't deserve it. It's not that God says, you know, he's really good, so I'm going to give him some more. I'm going to give him some blessings. We don't deserve anything that we have. It's all a testimony to the amazing goodness of our God. Now, here's the struggle. The struggle with grace really is twofold today. I mean, there's a lot out in the world. If you read some of the modern thoughts on grace, it's not new. It's been around for a long time, our struggle in understanding correctly God's grace. But if you were to listen, especially among God's people today, among those who are striving to follow what God says in his word, or at least ought to be striving, there seems to be two struggles with grace. One is described in Jude 4, where Jude describes the reason he's not preaching about grace or salvation. He was compelled to teach about something else and to write about something else. He says that there were certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago and have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality. And that's one of the thoughts today, that I'm going to abuse God's grace. And the way we do so is, you know, it doesn't really matter how you live. All that holy living, all that moral obedience, it doesn't matter because God will forgive you. That's the question that's posed in Romans 6. Shall we continue to live in sin so that grace may increase? Just keep on sinning because God's really good. We talked about that last night. God's really loving. He'll forgive me. We don't hear it that way often, that you can just live however you want to and God will forgive it. Some of the ways we might hear that today, this verse today is, you know, all that stuff about doctrine, authority, pattern, that's not really what matters most. Let's just focus more on God's love. Let's, let's just place our, our emphasis on God's grace. You know, I've, we hear language like, I've grown past Bible authority. 
In my studying and my understanding and my new enlightenment, I've, I've thrown past that old way of command, example, necessary inference. And I've, I've seen that God's grace is really what, what it's all about. Or it's been said in pulpits, in our own congregations, that pattern theology, the biblical pattern, or opinion issues or bias issues, the statement was, if you're in Christ, it doesn't matter what you do. Now think about that. Pitting that together. A New Testament pattern, the pattern that God has laid down. If you're in Christ, if it's for Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do. Does that sound biblical? That it doesn't matter what you do if it's for Jesus? I think of a Colossians 3 and verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. It seems to matter to Jesus. Or maybe another from the Scriptures, what says the Scriptures? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. The Scripture says it does matter what you do. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. We've looked a lot at Matthew 7 this week about not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father will enter. It matters what we do. And so there are some who are saying all that old stuff about law, about the worship of the church and the organization of the church, the issues that took place in the 50s and 60s. Let's, let's just be done with that. All that did was create issues and, and struggles. Let's just talk about love and grace and as casting and leading the sheep of God into a dangerous path. It doesn't matter how you live because God's grace is going to cover us like an insurance policy. That, that's, that's not what the scripture says. But the other side of the struggle, and I think where a lot of us struggle, is that we believe, as the scripture teaches, we're saved by grace. We understand that, but we live as if we're saved by works. One author kind of described it this way. He says, the church has spent so much time instilling in us the fear of making mistakes that she has made us like the ill-taught piano students. We play our songs, but we never really hear them because our main concern is not to make music, but to avoid some flub that will get us in trouble. Or he go on to say that some of us seem so anxious about avoiding hell that we forget to celebrate our journey to heaven. That there's an an off balance somewhere that we believe we have to do things so perfectly, perfect obedience, perfect living, that we never really feel confident that we're saved. We never really feel confident that we are forgiven, and we wrestle with that question we talked about last night, and that is, do I really know I'm heaven bound? Can I know for sure that I would be in heaven when Jesus returns? That's a struggle for a lot of us. In Titus chapter 2, where we're going to spend our time this morning, I want you to listen how Paul describes the immense change, the transforming power and intention and plan of God's grace. Titus 2 and verse 11, Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Ignore the chapter. Keep going. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. And not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. A few things right here, right from this section about grace. First of all, the grace of God declares our worth. 
The grace of God appears, he says in verse 11, bringing salvation to all men. The grace of God appeared. Well, how did the grace of God appear? What is he pointing to? To Jesus' appearance, to the coming of the Son of God. John 1, 14, a powerful statement that John opens with this gospel. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son, the one and only, the one Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came and Jesus is grace. The fullness of all it means to be truth of God and grace. Or some would say, he is true grace. He is full truth. He is God in the flesh. He is a demonstration of all of, love, of the love and the kindness and the mercy of God. How is that seen? How did that grace appear? How is that grace demonstrated? Well, on that dark Friday, with the three nails, the six hours, the one cross as the Son of God hung for the sins of the world. Why did he do so? Why did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Why did God send his son to die for our sins? You know, there's really multiple reasons to it, and it's important to understand why. One of the reasons that Jesus died on the cross, one of the reasons the cross was necessary is because of who our God is. In Psalm 89 and verse 14, it describes that the throne of God, the very foundation of his throne, is righteousness and justice. Our God cannot be a just God and just sweep things under the rug. I know you sin, but we're just going to ignore that and go forward with what you've done. In order to be a just God, something had to be done. A payment had to be made. And so, as described by Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse 9, much more than having now been justified, free from guilt by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. So why did he die? Well, because, because someone had to die. The wages of sin are death, and if it's not you and I, a price had to be paid. Blood had to be shed. But we talked last night, and this is where we stand. The reason he died was much more than simply meeting a price, was satisfying justice that had not been met. The, the statement is made in Revelation 1 and verse 5 that Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. The last phrase is justice. He freed us from our sins by his blood. But that first phrase is the motivation and the reason. It wasn't simply a contract that he had to keep, a covenant that he had to keep. It was moved and motivated by love. That's the heart of grace. You don't deserve this, and you don't earn this, but because of how deep I love you, I am giving my son for you. And brethren, at the heart of this section, understanding grace is understanding the depth of God's love for you and I and our worth, our worth. Paul says we are God's possession. Verse 14, a people for his own possession. That word redeem means to bought, to buy, to purchase. Keep your marker here in Titus 2 and go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to look at just one phrase that's used here. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to ask it from our perspective. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. He says, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in the fear of God during your time, your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Can you see that in verse 18? And maybe put yours there. You are worth more than all the silver and gold combined on earth to your God. You're worth more than your 401k to your God. You're worth more than your career right now and all of the titles that you will accumulate on earth to your God. You're worth more than your marital status to God. You're worth more than all the children you could have or want to have or desire to have one day to your God. You're worth more than your pride and your name and your friends and your popularity. All the things that we believe are the source of value on earth. He says you're worth more than all of that to God because he gave what meant the most for you, for me. Immense value is at the heart and wrapped up in God's grace. 
One of my favorite illustrations of this is of a boy who went to Lowe's and he bought the wood to make his own little ship, little sailboat, and he made it. He made it and he built it all his own. He painted it. And after finally completing this ship, he took it out to the little river that was behind their house and he had a string on it and he put that boat out there and he just watched it sail with pride. My boat's not sinking and he was so happy. But a gust of wind came and it caught that sail and that string snapped. And he watched in horror as his ship went down the stream. The next day, he was walking through the downtown where they lived, and in the window of the pawn shop was his boat. And so he went inside and he said, hey, hey, that, that, that's mine. My name's on the bottom of that boat. And of course, the owner said, finders, keepers, if you want it, you have to pay the price. Well, he didn't have any money, and so he ran home, and he asked for any chore he could do to make the money. And so he did the dishes. He mowed the yard. He bathed the cat. He would do whatever it is he could do to make money. And when he finally had enough money, he ran back to the pawn shop and he bought the boat. He carried that boat in his arms and before reaching home said this, you are special to me. I made you and I bought you. You are twice mine. How does our God see us? I made you, and you ran far from me, but I have bought you back. I made you, and I bought you, and you, you are twice mine. The grace of God is a source, the constant source, brethren, our foundation of our worth and value in life. The grace of God, back in our context in Titus chapter 2, provides our identity. Because again in verse 14, he says that he gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And what he's saying here is that this grace, this gift of grace, redefines the way God's people ought to see themselves and identify themselves. In one sense, he describes it as a people who are avoiding the things that brought death. The grace of God appears in verse 12, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Anything that is opposed to God, any thought, any desire, any word, any habit, anything that leads me away from God, the things that ruin my relationship in the first place, he says the grace of God, God's goodness, teaches us to stay away from that. And brethren, for you and I, perhaps a great warning for us today, it's not just don't go back and live that life. Don't go back and do the things you did before. Maybe the greater warning for us today is don't find enjoyment. Don't be entertained in the things that Jesus came to die for. Let's think about the things we're listening to. Uh, let's spend some greater time examining the things that we're watching in our leisure and entertainment. And I'm, am I going to find joy, entertainment, and the very things that Jesus came to give his life from for, for the things to rescue us from? And chapter 3 that same kind of teaching about the things to avoid, he is described this way in verse 2. To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For all men. For every single person. Do you see that there? That you're not going to speak evil of anyone. It doesn't matter how they vote. It doesn't matter their policy or what position they're going to find themselves in in our land. It doesn't matter how they and I might disagree. It doesn't matter how obnoxious they are on Facebook. It doesn't matter how they're going to live today. Malign no one. No one. Speak evil of no one. That you're not going to use your tongue. You're not going to use your Facebook. You're not going to use your text messages to tear down anyone. Why? Because we used to be this way. Do you see that? Because we, in verse 3, we were foolish. What's it mean to be foolish? Spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Using our God-given tongues our God-given brains to rip and tear into another made in his own image. There's enough of that. There's enough. Sowing seeds of distrust in shepherds all through Facebook. Sowing suspicion in marriages because of abuse that's taking place in circles around our country. A speaking evil and harsh and criticizing and condemning those who don't align and see things exactly the way that I do. 
the grace of God teaches us that these redeemed people live different than how we were before. That the people of God live and think and speak differently because the grace of God rescued us from that life. And that's the opposite, is that it teaches us then to pursue the things that bring life. He describes it as self-control, a people who are in control of their mind and their bodies and their habits. He describes it as a people who are pursuing what is right. Zealous, he says, for good deeds. And in chapter 1, he reminds them to be obedient in good deeds. And then even in chapter 3, he talks about obedient to rulers, whether it be rulers in the land and the governing forces, rulers in the home, moms and dads and the authority God has given to them, or rulers in the congregation, that is, shepherds entrusted with the oversight of souls. That the grace of God doesn't just say, I saved you from this, now avoid it. It says, I want to show you the right way to live. That you're not pursuing, you're not using your energy and your time for the things that destroyed you before. You're using every ounce, every gift of God's good gifts, of God's good blessings to pursue him. A life that honors and pleases him. Do you see what's really wrapped up in this? It's a new identity. We're, We're brand new from the inside out. And I think we need a warning here. Listen to me for a moment because this might sound a little strange. I don't know if you've heard it before. We've struggled with this back home, that perhaps in some of our opening words in, in a Sunday morning when we have a lot of guests with us, it's easy to hear language like this, welcome, we're so glad you're here. We don't know where you're from, but you're welcome here because all of us are sinners here. We're all sinners trying to, trying to please our God. What that sounds like is we're all the same and, and no one's different and we're all trying to follow God wherever where we are. Do you know what the problem with that is? If we have obeyed that gospel, we're not sinners anymore. We're, we're not lost and broken. You hear that language, I'm just a broken vessel. I'm just a mess, but I'm God's mess. I, I am just a sinful wreck, but God loves me where I am. Well, God does love me, but listen, what sense of it when God has from blindness given a sight to walk around still saying, I'm, I'm blind, I'm blind, I, I, can't, I can't see. For God in the language who has made us mended and whole to say, I'm, I'm broken, I'm a broken vessel. To God who has forgiven us of our sins to walk around saying, I'm, I'm just a sinner. It's not claiming that we're perfect. But listen, even in 1 Timothy, keep your mark here, go to 1 Timothy, or uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because in 1 Timothy 1, Paul will use the language in verse 15. He says, it is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am the foremost of all. Well, isn't that what we're talking about? Look at the next phrase. Yet for this reason I found mercy. I was a sinner. And if you're looking at everyone, I would make the top of the list. But I found mercy. But I was given grace. I, I'm not a sinner anymore. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect. John says if we say we have no sin, we lie and deceive ourselves. But there's a big difference in the identity of claiming that I am a sinner and I am broken and I am blind and I am a mess versus the language of God's people described in the New Testament as saints, as children of God, as the redeemed, as healed, as forgiven. It's not because I'm great. It's not because I'm kind of some kind of a super saint. No. By God's grace, I am what I am. That's what I'm claiming. I used to be lost, but now I'm found. I used to be blind, but now I see. Didn't we sing that already this week? Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Like the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done in me. One of the quickest ways to continue down the path of rebellion to God is to grab onto an identity. I'm just a broken person. I I can't help it. God loves me anyway. We're not anymore. Adopted children don't claim to be orphans. We are God's people. He has cleansed us, claimed that identity. There's something different about where we are now compared to where we have been, and the grace of God is the difference between the two. 
The grace of God back in our context motivates our obedience twice. In verse 11, and this grace of God appeared bringing salvation to all men. He says that we are to be, in verse 14, zealous for good deeds. And verse th- uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, ready for good deeds. There, there's always a conflict in the mind of some when it comes to the grace of God about earning our salvation because of any act of obedience that we do that God commands, that God expects. That some say in order for God's grace truly to be a free gift, he can't really expect anything in return. That if you're really going to claim it is a free gift, there can't be any conditions in order to meet along the way. But we know that doesn't make any sense. I mean, you find things like these, these $10,000 prize giveaways, these bonanzas. But you always find at the very bottom that there's conditions that apply. That's always what no one really sees. The $10,000, which is probably $100, and the rest are going to taxes and other people. There's conditions that apply. Now, say I did this. Say I followed every condition that was in this $10,000 bonanza. The right email, I accepted the tax uh, exchange. After I received the prize money, can I go around to people saying, I earned this, I deserve this. No, you know why? It's literally called the give away. They gave it to me. I did nothing to earn this or to deserve it. All I did was meet the conditions that the prize, that the prize accepted, that the prize set, that the company set. And so when we find a a statement, like in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace. What's the condition God has set for receiving the saving grace? Faith, an obedient faith, a trusting faith. The conflict with some today is saying, well, hold on, because the Bible says a lot about grace and works and faith and works. And if you claim to do any kind of work, then you're, you're all, all of a sudden earning and deserving and trying to work your way home. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. Galatians 3 and verse 10, certainly there's context where Paul would mention works in context with faith and obedience and salvation. And the times he does in the book of Romans, whether it's Romans 3 and 4 or Romans 11 or even here in Galatians 3 and verse 10, where he says, For as many as are the works of the law are unto a curse, for his written curse is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. Here's the issue. Here's what Paul's trying to get them to understand. He's not saying, you don't have to do anything to be saved. God's just going to scoop you up and take you home. What he's saying is, if you try to be saved by works alone, the only way to do so is to keep them perfectly. And we left perfect behind a long time ago. The only way to be saved by works by law, is perfect law keeping. That's why it's cursed. Because man can't keep up. Man has sinned and fallen along the way. That word works doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to, to obey him or to serve him. What's Philippians 2 and verse 12? Work out your own salvation. Even here on the screen, our introduction to grace through faith. And the book of John, go to John in chapter 6 with me. And John 6, this literal statement is made about faith and a working faith. That is the demonstration of faith as a work. In John chapter 6 and verse 29, the question is asked of Jesus. John chapter 6, the question is asked in verse 28. They said to him, what what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So to say we have no works to do or there's no works in order to be saved, faith is a work. Our obedience to God is a work. James 2.18, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. None of this is to say, I'm earning heaven. I am deserving heaven because I'm keeping God's commandments perfectly. The right language is what Jesus would say in Luke 17 and verse 10. You also, when you've done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. I'm just a servant of God, and I simply want to do what my master has commanded. I've not earned it. I've not deserved it. I've just sought to obey God. So walk it through with me just for a moment. This is an easy exercise. My kids got this right away. Noah was saved by grace when he built the ark. Could Noah go around and say, I saved myself. You see that ark? I saved myself. I built that boat. No. You know why? He only knew about the ark because God told him. God told him about the flood. He told him about the boat. He told him how to build the boat. 
And the fact that that boat succeeded, that it didn't sink or wreck, was by the grace of God. Well, when did Noah receive that grace? When he built the boat, when he did all that the Lord had told him to do. Israel was healed of that snake bite in Numbers 21 when they had rebelled against God again and again and again. And so he had those fiery serpents that came and bit and left them poison stricken. They were healed of that, of the snake bites by grace when they looked at the bronze serpent. Could they go around and say, we did that. We, we healed ourselves because we looked at that bronze statue. No. Do you know why? Because looking at things that are bronze don't make you better. It might make you worse. What healed them? God's grace. When did they receive that grace? When they listened to God when they looked at the serpent, when they obeyed the command of the Lord. Naaman, who had leprosy, an incurable disease, was healed by grace. When he dipped in the Jordan, could he go around all serious saying, I did this, I healed myself? No, because leprosy isn't healed by taking a bath. Otherwise, every person who had leprosy would be healed for all time simply by getting in the water. Well, what cured Naaman? Grace, God's grace. When did he receive that grace? When he did what God told him to do, when he dipped in the Jordan. The Israelites conquered Jericho by grace when they marched around the walls. Could they say on that seventh day, we did that, we did that, that's our strength. No, do you know why? Because walking around the walls don't make them fall down. Not for seven days, not for 700 days. What made those walls fall down? God's grace. When did they receive that grace? When they marched, when they listened, when they followed God's commands. The blind man was healed by grace when he washed in the pool of Siloam. Water doesn't clear, clear and heal blindness. God's grace did. But he received that grace when he listened to the words of Jesus. And the same thing took place in Acts 2. The Jews on Pentecost were forgiven of their sins by grace when they repented and were baptized. That's the heart of Acts 2. Peter said to them, repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That phrase in red, for the forgiveness of your sins, that's the grace of God taking away sin that we, that we brought in our own life. The fact that God is willing to forgive that, that's his grace. When did they receive that grace? When do we receive that grace? When we do what he has commanded and we are baptized, repenting of our sins and immersed in water. Can we go around saying, I've done that. I have forgiven my sins. No, no. God did that. That's the whole point of Colossians 2 is that it is the working of God in baptism. But when do we receive that grace, that forgiveness of sins? When we simply do what our God has told us. We're not earning anything. We're not deserving anything. We are simply trying to meet what that Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 5 and verse 9, that he, Jesus, is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He's going to be the one that saves me. I'm just striving to please and honor and follow him the best that I can. And let's just end here. At the grace of God is sure salvation. Right in the heart of our text, he describes those who are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of glory in verse 13. 2020, I was asked to take, play, take part in a Young People's Weekend, and the Young People's Weekend was designed around a poll. We asked all sorts of young people across the country, what are the things that you're curious about? What are the things that you're struggling with? And one of the questions that was asked of these young people was, what is your greatest or your biggest fear? And 185 people responded, missing heaven. Now think of that. This is our young people. We took this to FC camps. We put it on Facebook. We asked all sorts of congregations around the country, what are your greatest fear? And of those pulled, 185 of our young people said, I'm afraid of missing heaven. And in one sense, that's, that's kind of encouraging that so many young people would have this as their greatest fear, that they're thinking so much about heaven and wanting to be home with God. But there's another part of that that's really sad and it's concerning that there's so many young people who are living so uncertain of their soul salvation. So much of this comes back to the things we've talked last night, and it comes right here. It's about me. I just don't feel like I'm good enough. I just don't feel like I've done enough. 
I, I, I just don't feel like I have lived a life that God would allow me in because of the way I've lived or my obedience or my works. I don't feel like I've served enough, taught enough, uh, obeyed enough. I, I just don't feel like I am enough for heaven and it all rests on me and the confidence is on me and my trust is on me and the reason I don't feel good enough for heaven is because I'm trying to earn my way there. I'm trying to deserve my way there. That's what they're taught in school that if you want an A, you have to put in the work to get the A. That if you want to be the star athlete, then you have to perform so well to be the star athlete. And they think, if I want to get to heaven, I've got to be the all-star Christian. And I've got to serve more than anyone else. And I've got to live a perfect life. And brethren, if it's about perfection, none of us are going to make it to heaven. The confidence in grace. Can you walk it with me? 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes in verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. It's not I know of whom or even in whom. I know Yahweh. I know the one God. I know him. And I know him to be faithful and true. I know him to be a God who keeps his word. And if God has promised that those who obey King Jesus and submit to him and follow him are forgiven and are heaven bound, then that's where I will stand. I am convinced he will keep his word until that day. Even that statement from 1 John chapter 5 that we looked at last evening in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Why do we know we have eternal life? Because we believe in the name of the Son of God. We believe in him. And it's not just that we believe him to be the son of God. I believe in his blood and the power of his blood and the cleansing work of his blood. I, I believe in that and in Calvary. And I believe and I trust that that was for me. And I believe in his promise that if he says that I will be with him one day, that where he is I will be also, then I believe in that. And I trust in that because I trust in this Jesus. Because I believe in this Lord. And if he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that it's not about living life perfect, that it's not about perfect obedience from here to home, that God's grace is what's going to see me through, then I believe that. Then I believe even though I'm striving to the best that I can to honor God with every ounce that I have and to be pleasing with him in all things, if he says at the end of the day I'm saved ultimately by his favor and his kindness and his grace and that's all met through faith, then I'm going to believe in him and follow him and live a life of faith knowing and trusting that when I get there at that last day, it's only by his goodness and by his mercy that I will be there in heaven. Only people saved by grace will stand with him in glory. The only ones in heaven will be there by the wonderful and marvelous grace of God. Which is why Peter would say, then fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you. Not on yourself. Not on all the accomplishments that you've done. And brethren, not on all the ways that we have perfectly and, and sought to meet, to obey and serve God. Let, let our hope be not on Jordan Shouts and the life that Jordan has lived. Let's let it be on Jesus and the grace that he will bring. Dad wrote in a jump start, maybe last week or so, about a man named Jimmy. Jimmy has 28 days left on this earth. Jimmy is a Christian. Jimmy came to the gospel not through a preacher or a Bible class or a sermon, not through a tract. He came simply through reading the Bible. He is in prison, and the television was broke, and he was ashamed to admit the first uh, reason he read the Bible was because he was bored. And so he read all the way through the Bible, but then the TV was still broken, so he read through a second time, and he paid closer attention the second time, and in reading the Bible all on his own, all on his own, he realized that he is a sinner, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he must repent from his sins and be baptized to be saved, and Jimmy was immersed and, and was saved by the grace of God. Jimmy is set 
and 28 days to be executed by the state of Alabama for the crimes that he has committed. Jimmy will have never sat in a worship service, will have never met more than but a few handful of brethren. He will have never taken the Lord's Supper. He will have never sat through a sermon or a Bible class. But Jimmy is heaven bound. Two things that shows us, brethren. One is everything we've been talking about this week. Simply through reading the scripture, he found Jesus. He obeyed the gospel. What saith the scripture? When he simply read, he obeyed. Just the scripture. But second, if someone like Jimmy, someone who has murdered and is sitting on death row, can be forgiven of their sins and be heaven bound, is there not immense, incredible hope for everyone? Not just for us, and the confidence that ought to give to each one of us of God's amazing love. But for every prodigal, for every wanderer and rebellious person we love in our lives, there's, if there's hope for Jimmy, there's hope for every one of us. One thing Dad wrote about Jimmy is that he says, even though his life is taken, they cannot take heaven from me. Jimmy has fixed his hope completely on the grace of God. Can't we stand there? No matter what comes, if I am in Jesus, nothing can take heaven from me. Praise God for his amazing grace. Thank you, my brethren, for listening so well. Let's take a break. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you.
nice time. Please come to your seats. One of the traditions that started years ago with the lectures, our members wanted to uh, make the speakers feel welcome just as soon as they came to town. And so several of them got together and put welcome baskets in their hotel rooms. And uh, that continued for several years until 2018 when the elders decided for the lectures we were going to have all of the preachers back who had been in the preacher training program, which uh, at that time was 12 men for the lectures. And so that seemed a little overwhelming to make that many welcome baskets, and so the decision made we just won't do that this year. And we forgot to tell Tim Stevens, who was expecting his. <laughs> and so Tim tells a story. He was coming with his grandson, Ryder, that year, and they're making the drive here. He tell, told Ryder, we don't have to stop for snacks. You won't believe this basket that's going to be in our room when we get there. And he said they walked in the room, and Tim said he was looking under the bed, and he was looking in the shower. And... Well, I think we made up for it in Cracker Jacks this year, Tim. And he's just done an amazing job for us again. And I love how he highlights in the songs that he chooses certain phrases to demonstrate this is what we're thinking about right now. This is what we're focusing on from the Word of God. And the lectures wouldn't be the same without his participation. So as you can see, he's going to lead us in a uh, song, I Choose Jesus, before Russ's final sermon on what says the Scriptures, Choose Life. Let us sing.
Open your Bibles, if you would, and put your bookmark in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Good morning to you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your kindness. As we've said repeatedly, uh, thank you for everything this week. It is a joy to get to be here, uh, and, and, and a special joy that most people won't ever get to enjoy, uh, to be asked to speak here. It, it is an honor. It is humbling. It is overwhelming. It is nerve-wracking. Uh, I, in, in all honesty, it, uh, it, it is a high-stress week be, because y- you want to get up here and you want to do the best job you've ever done in your whole life to, to preach uh, because, of, uh, because the expectations are high and yeah, because of all the good preachers that you all have had through the years. And uh, uh, it, it is humbling. It, it really is. Uh, I, I enjoy working with these guys. Ken, thank for all your work of service. You and Norma, uh, your writing, uh, the, the good that you have done for so many people and continue to do. It's an honor uh, to get to, 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 to work with you. David, uh, whom I owe an apology, uh, and he reminded me this morning that he did not go find some obscure translation to find the word stupid. It's in the New American Standard Version. But he did have to go all the way to Jeremiah to find it because it wasn't in Isaiah. Uh, It has been a joy to hear you preach. This is the first week I've ever got to hear David preach. Uh, And uh, you've done phenomenal. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Uh, To Jordan, uh, you know, sometimes as you get older, and it's kind of hard for me to think in these terms, this is where I am. Uh, you look at the guys behind you, it's probably the way that Brother Caldwell felt when, when I was at Florida College. Uh, th- there were times when you look at the younger guys and you think, man, we are in trouble. Uh, but I don't think that when I look at Jordan and uh, Devin and some, some younger guys of that generation with such great ability and great passion. And uh, it's been an honor. I appreciate your work. Appreciate your family. Love your kids. They love me, uh, by the way. <laughs> Noah did come up to me yesterday evening after services and said, Mr. Russ, my daddy is really my favorite preacher. And Emma said, you're still number one. (laughs) And I'm pretty sure I heard Debbie Shouse behind her go, you're right, baby, Russ is number one. These things are a lot of fun in that regard. I was at FC one year, and the year before at the lecture, somebody dropped a big banner that said, Welcome to the Pillsbury Preach-Off. And sometimes lectureships kind of devolve into that that kind of thinking, and that's a lot of fun. But who, who is David and Ken and Jordan and Russ but... Paul and Apollos, ministers through whom you've believed. It it is an honor to get to do this, and I thank you. Thanks to the elders, to the folks who've had us in your homes for all your hospitality. We could go on and on. I I am not going to do that. Thanks to Tim and Vicki and the great work that they do. It's always a joy to be with y'all. So let's kind of finish up the things that we've been talking about. Oh, I I do want to throw this in. I meant to mention this last night. It has nothing to do with much. Uh, except to some of those who preach, and, and this made an impact on me. The first night after we finished, Noah came up to me, sitting right back there in the middle of the pew, and he said, I have a question. Debbie actually said, Noah's got a question for you. And so I sat down in the pew, and he said, how do you know what to say when you don't have it on PowerPoint? I thought that was hilariously funny, but but I want to make a point about that that has nothing to do with the lesson. I have watched all four of these guys at some point during their lesson do this. You pick up your Bible, you walk off, and you read it. And if you preach the gospel and you use audio visual, I have no problem. There There are a lot of guys that use that very effectively. More power to you. But make sure your kids and your people understand The authority ain't up there. The authority is here. So be aware of that because this is a generation growing up with things that we didn't grow up with. And so uh, for what it's worth, uh, we could offer invitation from sermon number one, but let's go to sermon number two and the reason that we're here this morning. Tracy and I celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary last week. It is the one time in the year where we go out to eat where the question is never asked, where do you want to go eat? 
Most of the time we go eat and the question is, where do you want to go eat? And the response is, it's not my turn to decide. It's your turn to decide. I chose last time. If we did that at our anniversary, it would be the 33rd anniversary before we would decide where we wanted to go eat. Because by the time we decide where we're going to eat supper, it's time to eat breakfast. Because that's a choice in 32 years of marriage that we haven't figured out yet. And if you've got some advice, I'd be glad to hear it. It is interesting that life is a series of choices. Some of them are big. Uh, two of my daughters are not married. I pray every day that God will give them a godly spouse that they can spend their life with and enjoy life and go to heaven when they die. And then I pray, if there's not that man out there, please do not let them find the wrong one. Other than serving the Lord and accepting his grace, that's the most important decision in life. But some decisions aren't quite that big. Tracy and I like to go to Dairy Queen and get a blizzard. I always get the same thing, chocolate extreme. But Tracy, she, oh, it's, well, what are we choosing today? Oh, I don't know, cherry chunk? Are we going with the peanut butter thing? Who cares? You're going to come back the day after tomorrow and get something again. Those are choices that really don't matter. When God gets the children of Israel to the land, to the border of the land of Canaan, at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, which is kind of the, the, the other end of the spectrum from where we started, at least in my discussions this week. And they've been through the, the wilderness and, and they've enjoyed the manna and they've drunk in water from the rock and they've seen the miracles and they've been on this journey and a generation has died and, and God is winning victory and God's bringing them closer and closer and closer to the promise. And you get to chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, there is arguably the focal point, not only of the book of Deuteronomy, but of the history of the children of Israel to this point. See, I have set before you today life and good, verse 15, death and evil. And then I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that, go, that you go in to possess. But... If your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that, I will, that you will surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land that you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, notice the divine advice, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. The book of Deuteronomy is in many ways just kind of an overview of what happens in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Moses takes the time to review the things that have happened on their journey from Egyptian captivity to the land of promise. And he does so because he's talking to the kids. He's not talking to the generation that were adults when they came out. They've all died in the wilderness. He's reminding the kids of where they came from, of, of who God is and what God has done for them. And so you get to chapter 12 in Deuteronomy, and he just says, here's the law again. There's some real insight into the Deuteronomy recalling of the law. But for most of Deuteronomy from chapter 12 to chapter 26, it's just a summation of the things God has already told them. And then you get to chapters 27 and 28 where God says, okay, listen very carefully. If you're faithful to me, I'm going to bless you in ways you can't imagine. But if you're unfaithful to me, I'm going to curse you in ways that you can't imagine. And then he says, I offer you the covenant. You, you, you can accept my terms and I will bless you 
You can reject my terms and I will curse you. The choice is yours. What do we learn from that? Like the rest of the Exodus story, the, the temptation is to say, well, this is the way God's dealing with his people and it's the fulfillment. You just read it at the end of chapter 30. It's the fulfillment of the promise of the land promised to Abraham. Yes, it is, but there's much more going on here because the choice he's given them is the choice that Jordan just talked about. The grace of God has appeared that brings salvation. What are you going to do with that? Because there are curses involved and there are blessings involved and how you deal with the covenant that God has offered you is what's going to determine not whether you go into the land of promise on the earth, but whether you go to heaven or hell. That's why this is important. And so let me offer a couple of very simple observations. This is not hard stuff. It's not earth-shattering, but we need to be reminded. And this is, this is the way that Moses ends, God ends this section, so this is the way I want to end our study together this week. What we learn here is everybody gets to choose. Now, that's been underscored over and over and over, and you think, well, you know, but does that really need to be said? Yeah, because God says it. And he says it over and over. In fact, it's interesting that God says that because the idea of choices is one of the fundamental aspects of our nature. It is innate in us that we appreciate we get to choose. We choose everything all the time. Take these little kids. Pull one of them aside after services. Reach into your jacket pocket or your purse and pull out two pieces of candy, one peppermint and one strawberry. Are they going to go, hey, it doesn't matter. It's all sugar and mom and dad won't like it. No, they have to sit there and go, wait, you know, I kind of like peppermint. But strawberries, really good stuff. And they're going to choose. They're going to choose based on which one they like better. You don't have to sit there and tell them, choose. They know what's going on. Because it is an aid in us. And you know the reason that it's an aid in us? Because we are made in the image and likeness of God and we have free moral agency. We are not animals that are pre-programmed where we react in certain ways all the time simply because that's our nature. God gave us a mind. And so we get to judge things and weigh things based on how they appeal to us or don't appeal to us or, or based on the, 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 the impact and what we get from it or what we don't get from it. And that makes for really interesting contradictions in life. I laugh on a regular basis about the folly the stupidity of mankind. But by the way, Denise gave me a T-shirt for Christmas. <laughs> and this so describes mankind. Scientists tell us that the universe is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. They forgot to mention morons. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, look around at how we deal with freedom of choice. David talked about, I think it was David or, or Ken, talked about studying with a Calvinist. Which, which uh, Okay, David. Calvinism is an interesting theological philosophy. Basically what Calvinism teaches is that everything that happens in this world, and particularly in, in, cons in consideration of the concept of salvation, it, it is a tribute to the sovereignty of God, that God does everything. And then when it comes to salvation, we do absolutely nothing. We're either part of the chosen, we're part of the elect, or we're not. And if we are part of the elect, God acts upon us in certain ways, and we accept it, and we really have no choice in the matter. And it cracks me up every time I hear somebody say, I've decided that I think Calvinism is right. Think about that for a second. If Calvinism is right, you don't have to decide that. The fact that you've decided that you think it's right it is absolutely adversarial to the very concept itself. Protons, neutrons, electrons. And you see this all the time. All kinds of contradictions, all kinds of problems 
And I'm not trying to make fun of anyone. I am trying to get us to think about choice and how God has given it to us. I've studied with people who determine in their mind that they are of a particular sexual orientation. I don't know how many times I've studied with people who identify themselves as homosexual who have said, I had no choice. This is just the way that I am. And where that has gone (laughs) is now I am choosing my sexual identity. Well, Well, wait a minute. I thought you had no choice. Oh, no, no, I've chosen to transfer, to, 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 to uh, I've, I've lost the word. Somebody tell me, tra- transition, thank you. I was a transfer, all I could think of was transfer, which may not be completely inaccurate. I've chosen to transition. Why? Well, this is my choice. This is, I, I'm identifying myself in this particular way, and I'm not trying to, to dismiss or disregard people in that regard, but you are either born that way or you're deciding that. Which is it? You know, you know the freedom of choice makes for some odd circumstances. I, I, I hear people, I can't help it that, that I'm alcoholic. I, I can't help it that I have a bad temper. I can't help these character traits that I have. But, buddy, you do something wrong to me, and justice merits. Now, now what if I say, you know, I can't help it that I'm violent toward people I don't like. I I, I just can't help it. You know, it's not my choice that I stole your car. I'm compelled by an extra criminal gene. Hey, that's an argument that's made. And and, and somebody else goes, well, you don't have that right. Well, wait a minute. Do I have the right or not? Do, Do you see where the concept of free choice is something that human beings just on a regular base debate? The abortion view that we can kill a child is called pro choice. For which party? You're choosing, but the kid doesn't get to. A lot of conflict here. A lot of problem here. And and I, I want you to appreciate that this is why choice is such an important thing. Because we really need to develop the capacity, if we have the choice of choosing, to learn to choose well. Because this idea that I don't have any choice really doesn't hold water when you start looking at it in practical terms and the way that people use it. And one of the things that God is telling the children of Israel when they come to the land of promise is, I'm going to send you in, I'm going to plant you, I've got a job for you, I have shown you my power, I have shown you my will, I have shown you my person, now choose what you're going to do with that. Every Throughout the Bible story, every Bible character had a choice. We we understand it with Adam and Eve in the garden, Genesis 3. You you can either do what Satan encourages and and, and violate the, the, the condition that God placed upon your staying in the garden, or you can enjoy the grace of God that's been poured out upon you, and you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or you can go to Matthew chapter 4 and realize that Jesus, as a man, God in the flesh, he had a choice, and Satan pushes that. The irony of the first temptation being about bread and stones and Jesus quoting, you shall not live by bread alone, it it, it amazes me, given the power of that. But, But Jesus had a choice. I can comply with God or I can defy God. Moses had a choice. Abraham had a choice. Noah had a choice. He didn't have to build the ark. God told him to. God showed him grace in giving him the information. But Noah didn't have to do that. Abraham didn't have to leave his country. Moses tried really hard not to go to Egypt. I'm slow of speech. and uh, God didn't take that, 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 that excuse. Moses had a choice. David had a choice. Everybody had a choice. 
And God repeatedly calls us to that end. Joshua chapter 24, choose you this day whom you will serve. The book of Proverbs in chapter 1, wisdom calls out and cries out, and you would have none of me. You would not choose wisdom. Ezekiel chapter 18, the children of Israel in captivity and God's calling them back and telling them, don't tell me anymore that you don't have any choice and that the fathers have sinned, they've eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. It's your fault. The soul that sins, it's going to die. But I tell you what, repent and live. I, I take no pleasure in the death of one who dies. God tells them, turn and live. It's your choice. What's happened to you has not been determined by those who have gone before. You get to choose. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole of man. Why does Solomon say that? Because no other choice makes sense to him. And Jesus tells us, look, you can't serve two masters. You're going to have to, that, that you can love one and hate the other. You're going to hate one and despise the other. The, the reality is you've got to choose a broad way that leads to, to death, a, 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 a narrow and difficult way that leads to life. It is all over the scripture. So, Here's the first thing, that, that the most simple thing that we've said all week. Who are you going to serve? That's what the Bible boils down to. It's just that simple. And I'm going to tell you, the big choice is not hard. <laughs> you, you, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but go back to Deuteronomy 30 and, and look again at verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. What person in his right mind says, I think I'll take the death and the cursing? That's good to me. Bring on the suffering. Nobody wants that, especially if you go back and read what God says about the suffering. So the big decision's not hard. To, to decide, and, and let, me, let me underscore this to you young folks. The, the big decision of saying, I, I, I choose Jesus, that's not hard. You know what's hard? What's hard is the little decisions that come with that. It, it is the day-to-day -day grind of choosing to be holy when everybody around you is unholy, or choosing to be righteous when unrighteousness is so easy. It, it is choosing to sacrifice and be selfless when selfishness is so very easy. In fact, the reality is death and evil are much easier than life and blessing in the scheme of God. If it was just the big choice, we wouldn't have any trouble. But you're going to have to walk out of here having thought about the grace of God and our acceptance of such, the choice that we are asked to make, and, and why wouldn't I choose life? And you're going to walk out, and then you and I are going to have to live it day in and day out. We're going to have to exercise self-control when it's much easier to not discipline yourself. We're going to have to serve when it's much easier to be selfish. We're going to have to give ourselves to the, to, to the pursuit of the Word of God. When the Word of God sometimes is just challenging. But thanks be to God, we get to choose. The issue is an issue of devotion. It's very simply an issue of where's your will? What do you want more? I, I wish it was easier than that. I, I wish I had some kind of grand three-point PowerPoint presentation about here is how you make the choice, and boom, 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 we've covered it, it's there, it's on PowerPoint. It, it is forever in the mind of Noah Schaus. And there we go, we've got it down, but it's just not that simple. It means every day I get up and choose to serve my God in every situation. So the question is, why would I do that? If it's hard, and it is hard. It's hard. It was hard on 
on, on Adam and Eve. It was hard on Cain and Abel. It, it was hard on Moses. It was hard on Noah. It was hard on Abraham. A lot of hard things in their lives. Hard on the Lord. Can you imagine being holy God, living among ho- unholy men for 33 years and never giving in? So why choose the good? Well, because, and here's number two, the decision carries with it extreme consequences. That's why. It's that, it's that simple. It's life and blessing or death and cursing. Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 makes a statement that in many ways is kind of the linchpin of the New Testament. I know that Acts 2 is, is kind of thought of as the hub but, but I want you to think about what Jesus says in Matthew 28. And we've talked about this already this week. I'm not going to belabor the point. All authority is given to me both in heaven and on earth. Therefore, he tells the apostles, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatever, all things I've commanded you. If that's true, I believe it is. We get to choose whether we believe it is. If it's true that all authority is given to Jesus, what Jesus tells us is, I didn't come this time to judge, but I am going to come again and judge. And I'm going to judge you based upon the words that I've spoken to you. That's in evidence in a, in a, in a whole bunch of different passages, John 5, John 12. And what that means is that I'm accountable and that this is the standard I'm going to be held to. All these things we talked about this week, be it how we deal with our brethren, be it the path that we choose and that we recognize, be it baptism, be it worship, be it, be it the grace of God, regardless of what we have discussed or will discuss or you'll ever hear out of any pulpit, the reason that it makes a difference is because if Jesus is true and right and really the Son of God in the flesh and really has all authority, then all that's going to matter at the end is whether or not I chose him. In Deuteronomy, what's happening is that after 40 years in the wilderness, the children of Israel have seen the power of God. They're not going to see it in the same way once they go into the promised land. There's not going to be a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire anymore. It's not going to be manna falling every morning to remind them that God's our provider. They've got the law, they've got the records, they've got the examples, they've got the evidence. God has laid it all out for them. But what they know is he destroyed a whole generation. He can destroy me. Jordan's already covered this this morning. He can bless me. I've seen what he's done. Bread from heaven. I I, I recognize who God is. And now he's given me two options and only two options. We're right back to what's the real path to God. You see how all this fits together? The options are, verses 15 and verse 19, I've set before you today life and good. Verse 19, I've set before you today life and blessing. Well, let's think about that for a second. For the children of Israel, this blessing that he is offering them, if you flip back just a page or two, is, is, is a, a land that they can't imagine. They've been slaves for 400 years. Nothing that they had was their own. Nothing that they produced did they derive the immediate benefit of. They were there simply to serve the Egyptians. And now what God is saying is, I want you to understand what's going to happen if you're faithful. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 3. Blessed you will be in the city, and blessed you will be in the country, and blessed will be the fruit of your body, and the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, and the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. If you stop right there, a lot of uh, we don't live in an agricultural culture anymore. But those of us who grew up in an agricultural culture, do you appreciate that? Because when you plant a crop in Indiana with 400,000 vegetables and fruits... There is no guarantee any of them are going to come up. And you get out there and weed it and you water it and you do everything you can. You prepare the soil, you till it, you fertilize, you you, you put the herb aside, you put the pest aside, you do all of that in the end, it still may not produce. 
you raise cattle and you put the right bull with the right cows, there's still no guarantee it's going to produce. And when your livelihood is completely dependent upon the agricultural product of all the work that you've done, what a blessing to say everything you do is going to work. By the way, do you appreciate that what God is doing here is undoing the curse of Genesis chapter 3? The ground will produce thorns and thistles, not if you're obedient under the old law. And so he goes on. In battle, he says, later on in verse 7, your enemies will rise against you only to be defeated for your face. They'll come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Well, man, we fight with guns and drones and missiles that can go halfway around the world. We don't get this. They fought with swords and spears face to face. Can you imagine giving Bubba a sword? No, no, wait a minute. And telling him, go fight Ken. Now, Ken's a whole lot older than Bubba. But Ken's arms are this long. And Bubba's arms are like this long. And Bubba's swinging that sword, and Ken's got one arm over here holding Bubba's head. He can't get to Ken. And Ken just stands there for a while and finally goes, all right, I'm tired of this. You're dead. Now, we can laugh at that, but do you appreciate in hand-to-hand combat like their world involved what it meant to go up against someone who was bigger, David and Goliath? someone who was stronger, someone who was on a horse, someone who was in a chariot. Do you see what God's promising them? You'll never be defeated. They'll come out against you, and when you're done with them, they're going to be running seven different ways away from you. In fact, when Joshua sends them off at the end of Joshua, he takes this one step further, and God says, now remember, they've already defeated all the armies in Canaan, but they haven't taken their individual lands. So there's still battles to be won, and what God to Joshua says is, one of you will go out and you're going to chase 100 people off. What a promise that was. This is what God says. I'm not unreasonable. I'm I'm not a harsh taskmaster. I'm not a hard man like Jesus talks about in the parable uh, of the talents. I knew you were unreasonable and you reaped where you didn't. So that is not the God that we serve. He's not standing at 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 the edge of heaven watching you live, waiting to cast you down into hell because you're never going to be good enough. He knows you're never going to be good enough. He made a law to show you you're never going to be good enough just so his grace can reach out and offer salvation. He wants to bless. And for them, David becomes king. Actually, Saul becomes king. And, and, and we think of the, the epitome of the kingdom in the Old Testament being during the days of Saul, uh, Solomon because stones were like silver in the streets of Jerusalem. Do you appreciate when David is mourning the death of Saul and Jonathan? He talks about the women of Israel being clothed in scarlet with gold ornaments about them because of the work of Saul. I want you to understand, in the days of the monarchy, God showed them what he can do for people who are faithful. Choose life. Choose blessing. Look at what I can do. And, and, and he does that so, that so that we know what's coming. I don't know what heaven's going to be like, folks. I, I really don't. I have my opinions. They don't amount to much. But whatever it is, it's going to be great. It's going to be beyond what we can imagine. It's going to be the fulfillment of everything that we could possibly want or need or even hope for, probably far beyond that. And it all starts with having a life of purpose and being able to enjoy forgiveness and not getting up every day and grieve over all the things that we've done because we understand the grace of God and we understand forgiveness and we can live a life where we find joy in the midst of difficulty. We live a life where we can still sanctify the Lord God and, 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 and give a defense of Him even when we're suffering. You realize that's what Peter's telling us in 1 Peter chapter 3. He's not simply saying anytime somebody wants to talk about the Bible, have an answer. What he's saying is when it looks like God's against you, you can still argue that God is for you. 
What a blessing. That's what we're living for. That's why D. Bowman used to end all of his lessons by going, if you miss heaven, you've just missed all there is because life and blessing is to our benefit because of the good, gracious God that we serve. But here's the other side of that coin. (laughs) Death and evil. Death and cursing. Again, it it, it amazes me that anybody would consider this. And and that does raise the question, why is it that people choose the way they choose? I'll tell you why. Because of immediacy and temporality and selfishness and laziness and because we have an adversary who plays on all of that. It is a serious consideration to think about death and evil. Turn in your Bibles right quick back to to the book of Leviticus in chapter 26. Leviticus 26 is the first time that God attaches blessings and curses to the covenant. This is the, the, the blessing and cursing section he gives to these people's parents, the folks we're talking about in Deuteronomy 30, Deuteronomy 26. This is what their mom and dad heard. And it is interesting to me because the Deuteronomy section And the curses that God offers to the children of Israel, they are brutal and graphic. But in the Leviticus section, there is a progression. Verse uh, 14 of Leviticus 20. If you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments and despise my statutes, if your soul abhors my judgment so you don't perform all my commandments but break my covenant, this is what I will do to you. I'll appoint terror over you, wasting disease, fever that will consume the eyes. You'll sow your seed in vain. Your enemies will eat it. In other words, you can rest assured you're going to plant all your crops and you're not going to get any benefit from them. I'll set my face against you. You'll be defeated by your enemies and those who hate you will reign over you. You'll flee when no one pursues you. And then when you get to verse 18 he says after all this if you don't obey me in other words I'm going to punish you it's going to hurt you're not going to like it but if you still don't get it then he ups the ante and then you get to verse 21 then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me I'll bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sin and then you get down to verse 27 after all this if you don't obey me but walk contrary to me I'll walk contrary to you in fury in, in the section where we've been studying in Deuteronomy, in chapter 28, what God promises is disease, disappointment. Last night we talked about children. Listen to this one. Your sons and daughters will be given to another people and your eyes will look and fail with longing for them all day long. What a horrible thing those people suffered. And everything that's mentioned by way of cursing in that section, the children of Israel experienced all the way to the cannibalism that he talks about at the end of chapter 28. You'll eat your children and you won't share them with the people you love the most. That's how bad things are going to get. And you think, how is it that a good, gracious God that Jordan just so well described, how is it that that God could do that? I'll tell you how. Because he gave them bread in the wilderness and he gave them water and he guided them to a a land where they enjoyed vineyards they didn't plant and wells they didn't dig and houses they didn't build. He was with them. He promised to bless them. He was going to take care of them. He revealed himself. He took care of them. He, he, He had promises that he was going to fulfill and they turned their back on him in preference for a piece of wood or a piece of rock or a piece of metal because they were stupid. And his response to that is, if you despise me and my blessings, this is what's going to happen to you. I have poured out my blessings and I am done with you. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The lesson for us is it's going to be a lot worse than that. And it's going to be worse, not because I understand everything there is about hell, place of darkness, lake of fire, prepared for the devil. That right there ought to get us. God's got a special place for Satan. 
Uh, absence of God, absence of good. Uh, there's so many things that we... I, I don't understand everything that's going to happen with regards to hell. But I'll tell you what's going to drive it. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy under the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will it be thought worthy who's trampled underfoot the Son of God who has counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, made holy to God a a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Don't think somehow or the other, you and I are, are, are going to be placed in the highest, most comfortable level of hell When we turn our back on our God, when he gave the best of heaven to die on a cross for us, this is why the choice is important. This is why it matters how we live our life. Because if you miss heaven, you missed all there is, but there is another side of that. You miss heaven and hell is all there is. Why would you choose cursing and death? Let me finish by saying this very simply, and this is where this context ends, back in chapter 30. Actually, God makes this statement before he gets to the choice part. God's given us really good reason to choose him. We've talked about it all week. I'm not going to over-elaborate upon it, but let me summarize. God's revealed himself. He didn't have to do that. He could have made us in his image and likeness, and the minute we stop being in his image and likeness, gone, Psh, I've had it with this bunch, I'm going to start over. In fact, he does several times. What is that telling you and I? Well, you know, God chunk us if we are not the people that he made us to be. Oh, that's unfair. No, it's not unfair. What's unfair is people that don't take advantage of the opportunities that we have to be what God designed us to be so that we can enjoy life. That's what's unfair. Unfair to God. God lays down years and years of evidence. Look at who I am. Look at what I've done. Look at what I said. Look at the promise I gave this guy. Look how I took care of Abraham. Look how I took care of Lot. I mean, I I sent my angels into Sodom and grabbed him by the hand and literally had to drag him out of town. Why? Because he daily despised the evil around him. Oh, Lot's a guy that gives me lots of hope. Look at what I've done. Look at what I'm going to give you. Look at my grace. Look at my sacrifice. Look at the apostles. Look at the prophets. Look at the evidence. Look at who I am. And trust me, Faith is a choice, folks. You had a little baby born here a few months ago. Y'all had a lot of little babies born. This little baby had some problems. There wasn't much certainty that this little baby was going to live. And her parents stayed up night and day with that little baby. That little baby's grandparents are some of my very best friends on the face of this earth. And people prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I got to thinking about that. 
Because in the last two years, I've lost people that I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that God would save. Doesn't always end up like Jordan's case. And I talked to Bobby and Amanda. And he said, give the kids a call, will you? Would you reach out to them? And I thought, what, what, what do you say? And I'm going to tell you what I say. This may not turn out the way you want it to. You may lose that little girl. But do not lose your trust in a good, gracious God who has eternity in mind because faith is something we choose. And God's suggestion is divine advice. I've set before you life and death, <laughs> blessing and cursing. Choose life. Can it be more simple than that? The God of the universe, dealing with mankind for thousands of years, and the complexity of the scheme of redemption, all that God has done to bring us to faith, and the last thing, the ultimate thing, the final thing, the crux of the matter... is boiled down to two words. Choose life. And so I'll leave you with my part this week with this simple retort from God. Choose life. If you need to make your life right, and we could help you this morning, we invite your response while together we stand and while we sing. Bowman, if you're able uh, to control the mics and lead prayer. Glenn is uh, one of our shepherds who's retired now, but even when he was working, he would take the week of lectures off, and uh, he's going to lead our dismissal prayer this morning. Thank you to all who have come to these morning sessions to start the day in the scriptures and with God's people. And uh, we've certainly been encouraged and edified by what the scriptures say. We'll have one final session, and then this lectureship will go the way of the other 42. So let's make the most of it. Tonight at 7, we'll have 30 minutes of singing, and then the final two lectures on the series of what says the scriptures. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you.
us pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for the time that we have spent together, for the blessing of the revelation of thy word by capable men who have come here, who prepared lessons to help us think, to help us choose wisely, to help us understand what grace is, to help us understand what love is, to help us understand how to wash away our sins, to help us understand all of the things related to your word, to help us understand the consequence of failing to serve you. Father, we're blessed. We're blessed as a congregation of people. We are get blessed as a gathering of people. Father, we know that throughout time and throughout the ages that we have lived here in this time, that you are creating an eternal kingdom, that you have given us the opportunity to become a part of that eternal kingdom, a choice that is an incredibly gracious thing that requires only believing on Jesus Christ as a savior and following a simple plan that he's given us to follow. Be with us, Lord. Thank you so much for these blessings. In his name we pray, amen.